Thank you so much, my dear. Thank you for that gracious introduction. Uh, thank all of you for uh, coming out this morning, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of what I think is going to be a historic uh, campaign. I've always wanted to work a little bit closer with uh, Code Pink. I've always respected uh, the work of this organization, always respected the work of my dear. In fact, I always wanted to do some CD with you. It, because people tell me that, and I think it's true, that you know uh, you could probably do a CD with uh, Madea and be relatively safe. Because normally, normally I'll, I'll be one of the first ones that the uh, police would grab. But I think if I do a CD with Madea, they'll run right past me and grab you. So let's try it one day. This is um, a very important campaign. Um, and as uh, Madea shared with you, uh, we have a, a new formation that we are developing. Uh, we launched this year, um, April the 4th of this year, to, um, in honor of the 50th anniversary of the very famous speech by Dr. King on April the 4th, 1967, in which he broke with the U.S. Uh, and came out in opposition to the Vietnam War. We thought that was a very uh, appropriate uh, moment uh, for us, uh, a moment for us to relaunch uh, the black anti-war movement here in this country. As many of you know, um, the black community has been fairly consistent in this anti-war stance uh, up until 2008. Uh, but uh, as a consequence of the change in administrations and the fact that uh, now people appear to be sort of thinking again, thinking critically, we thought that uh, the moment was here for us to uh, attempt to revive the traditional oppositional stance of the black community as it re relates to, to war. Um, and we see this effort, this alliance, as part of an effort to not only revive the uh, traditional black anti-war movement, but the broader anti-war movement here in this country. So we have been building since, uh, it's been a long process. We don't have um, uh, many resources, uh, but we do have a lot of enthusiasm and a clear understanding of the historic task before us. And that's why we were so happy to, to be one of the co-sponsoring uh, organizations of this uh, campaign. Now, we, we, we are, are going to approach this campaign um, in a very particular way. Of course, we are going to uh, uh, utilize the fantastic uh, support uh, resources that uh, uh, Code Pink is going to provide for the campaign. Uh, we want to though, make sure that as we do the work, that we ensure that the, the politics are remain front and center. We don't want to make sure that we don't uh, reduce the campaign. I'm sure it won't happen, but we want to make sure that we, we steer away from the campaign, campaign being more of a sort of a technical kind of campaign, and where the politics of the role of the state and the kinds of objective interests that are in, that are in play becomes less clear than what they should be. So when we look at this campaign and we uh, determine how we're going to approach the campaign, we, we, we come from a, a foundational point. And that point basically is we look at the state and we look at the role of militarism uh, and the role of militarism in terms of, of its advancement of particular interests. We say that when we look at the state, we understand the state to be an instrument for a rapacious white supremacist violent settler colonial capitalist system and a greedy and short-sighted ruling class. So we're clear about that. <laughs> we're clear that there is a convergence of interests uh, when it comes to the military, and, uh, industrial, uh, and intelligence complex and the corporate capital, capitalist media and even the cultural apparatus. We're clear that both parties are united in their commitment to upholding U.S. global hegemony. 
in which war and violence is a major instrument for maintaining that hegemony. We declare that the strategy that is guiding the activity of the state and holding this ruling class coalition together is their commitment to uh, the national security strategy, which is a full spectrum dominance that has united both neo-liberals and the liberal interventionists. And we've seen the consequence of this coalition, of this strategy. We've seen it in Iraq, in that disaster. We have seen it, um, and, and I, we continue to see it, in the second lo longest U.S. conflict, which is Afghanistan. Of course, we know that the longest conflict uh, that the U.S. is involved in is the war between the U.S. Uh, and North Korea that started in 1950 and continues. We've seen this uh, result in the attack on Libya, the uh, destabilization and war uh, in Syria, the continuation of uh, drone warfare and the uh, murder of innocent people. We've already talked about the tragic situation in Yemen. Uh, we've seen the, the ideological and moral confusion regarding what happened in Egypt. But uh, we've seen the uh, support for uh, destabilization and um, uh, in, in, in support of anti-democratic uh, movements and processes in Honduras. We've seen the expansion of the U.S. African Command across the African continent. Uh, we are watching with some bit of amusement as people are uh, wondering what uh, U.S. troops are doing in Niger. Um, we've seen the, the destabilization in Venezuela and the fact that the uh, Trump administration is building off of the uh, policies of the Obama administration in that country. And we have seen, uh, with somewhat uh, surprise, maybe not surprise, but definitely a disappointment in the debates or non-debates around the expansion of military spending here in this country. The obscene um, proposal by the Trump administra administration for increasing the budget by $54 billion and having that budget expanded even more up to this obscene level of $696 billion. So we recognize and understand what we are up against. And we, we understand the winners, and we know uh, the losers. The losers are basically the people of the world, the people of this country, who have their resources ripped off, uh, who are the subject um, uh, in the crosshairs of U.S. domestic uh, repression. We've already identified some of those winners, those major corporations, and we're not going to uh, talk about them again at this point. But what we say is that basically when we, when we take up this area of work in this campaign, this divestment campaign, uh, which is a very important uh, approach. Uh, many of us who were part of the uh, anti-apartheid movements um, some decades ago, remember we have in the audience we have our brother uh, Sadi Booker who was a central player in that, in that fight. We remember how, how uh, valuable that divestment instrument can be. That it, it allows you to raise all of the critical points. It allows you to start the process of delegitimizing what many people have just accepted as legitimate um, activity uh, and legitimate actors. It, it, it helps people to understand what interests are at play when they begin to follow the money. It puts people in a position where they have to, they're going to feel uncomfortable when the information is surfaced that suggests that they are complicit with the sufferings of people around the world. So that moral issue uh, is important. And we connect that moral issue to our political organizing. Uh, and we have, a, I think, a very effective process of delegitimizing militarism. So we are so happy that we are going to be part of this campaign. Now, we say that there's sort of though, three interrelated uh, components that we have to uh, take into account 
as we build the campaign uh, and engage in the work. Um, the very important, I think, uh, components because they are related to how we approach the work strategically. First, we have the ideological and cultural component. Well, we have to acknowledge that as we talk about war and violence, um, we have to understand the role that war has played in the, the evolution of this country, that uh, central to the U.S. experience um, and really has been a permanent uh, part of the uh, U.S. national identity has been this uh, commitment to militarism, to war. We know that basically when you have this kind of state that was uh, born out of violence, a settler state, that its very existence is the consequence of a military conquest of a people, um, then those cultures have a way of, of legitimizing violence, of normalizing violence. And that's one of the reasons why we have this very interesting conversation around gun control. So we have to recognize that we have uh, a very uh, deep-seated sort of ideological and cultural uh, bias toward the use of, of violence. We know that in this culture, uh, violence is very much tied to uh, the conception and understanding of what it is to be a, a male. So there's a, this gender component, and it's reflected in our attitudes, it's reflected in, in, in cinema, it's reflected in the games. In this culture, the way you deal with a conflict is you, you become violent. You, you hit somebody, or you attack someone. And that is very easy to go from that level of individual aggression to collective aggression. So we have to keep this in mind as we think about how we approach our political work. We have to keep in mind also a very, very important component of why we have a culture that seems to be quite comfortable in supporting war. And that is the fact that in this culture, the uh, ruling class propagandists have been very effective in utilizing the issue of race. That uh, the wars, most of the wars since the uh, end of the Second World War, 1945, have been wars between the US, Western Europe, and basically people of color. This ability to, to, to other yes. people and to dehumanize them uh, has been one of the most effective instruments they have been able to use. When you have, for example, a senator, uh, Lindsey Graham, who says, um, you know, there may be war between the U.S. Uh, and North Korea, but don't worry. People are going to die, but it's going to be those people over there. And the very fact that people did not react with outrage across the board is reflective of what I'm getting at. We have a real serious cultural problem here. So we've got to be in our, in our work. We've got to raise up this issue of race and white supremacy. We've got to be the ones to say that basically all lives, in fact, matter. We can't play a game by not addressing that issue in that way that one cannot be concerned about or, or, or play the game here and talk about, oh yes, black lives matter, but then you're silent when it comes to the lives of Palestinians or the people in, in Yemen uh, or the people in, in Libya uh, in the, or in the DRC. You know, we have to be morally consistent. We have to confront straight and center this notion of, of, of racialized value of life. We have a, a second component, the political and economic. And that is, and we refer to this briefly, we said that it's quite clear that both parties are committed to the political and material benefits of militarism. The very fact that when we had the vote in Congress to expand the military budget, and 117 Democrats in the House supported that expansion, then it's quite obvious where their interests lie. 
Some of you might recall that when uh, the Trump administration first proposed that $54 billion increase, even the Democrats, uh, you know, pretended to be uh, opposed. Because that was at the moment they were still in that process of, of, of completely trying to demonize uh, Trump. But all of a sudden they became quiet. And we saw what happened. They became quiet because they knew they're going to eventually support uh, that expansion. So we have both parties are committed uh, to the military uh, budget and militarism. We know that the financial and corporate uh, sector uh, is engaged in military production and has a grip on the political sector at every level of government. So it's not just the national level, but it's at the state and local level. So when we talk about divestment, we have to keep that uh, in mind. And we see the consequence of that grip on the local and the state level and the federal level when it comes to something very simple like uh, reducing the number of domestic military bases. Congress cannot even move to do that because of those entrenched uh, interests on those uh, state and local levels also. And we have the reality of a two-party monopoly that um, makes it very difficult for a third party or fourth party uh, who may have at the center of their platform, like the Green Party, uh, opposition to militarism, uh, commitment to peace. So these are some of the political issues we have to deal with as we, uh, <laughs> okay, as we build this campaign. Organizationally, we have marvelous opportunities, but we have to acknowledge that as we build this campaign, that we have a still very weak uh, and fragmented anti-war movement. And that we have an either, even weaker um, and uh, ideologically confused left and progressive sector here in this country. Uh, what this means is that this campaign has an opportunity to help to reverse that. That this campaign will be, I think, a marvelous uh, uh, opportunity to begin to build uh, long-lasting relationships uh, and to strengthen the broader anti-war movement uh, as we go forward. But one thing that we do want to try to avoid, though, is a dependency on too many NGOs uh, and what I call NGOism. That is, when we begin to reduce uh, this struggle to a more a technical one um, and lose the politics. What does it, all this mean in terms of strategy? It means that basically, uh, as we know, the ethical framework becomes primary. We've got to challenge the values. We've got to figure out a way in which in this campaign we delegitimize militarism uh, and even raise questions regarding the role of the military. Uh, we have to raise the issues of race in our work. Uh, we have to link this work to our ongoing fight uh, to make sure that the uh, increase in military spending, now that they're at the stage of, of appropriations, we have to oppose that, uh, make sure that uh, th that funding does not, in fact, uh, materialize. We have to connect this uh, campaign to the campaign that some of us are involved in, uh, in closing uh, all U.S. foreign military bases. Uh, we got to make those links. We have to um, talk about the 1033 program, that program responsible for transferring uh, military-grade hardware from the federal government to uh, police forces across this country. We have to um, uh, understand that we must make that link between militarism and the domestic. We have to approach the, and bring it to the conversation, not just the uh, companies involved in major arms sale, but let's also talk about the fact that uh, we have a, a arms industry with small arms also, that, um, that, the, that the U.S. is in fact the number one um, arms trader on this planet. So when we talk about, and people are concerned about the issue of gun, guns and gun control, let's link that to that fact 
of the U.S. being the number one arms trader on the planet. Okay? Because that has a direct impact on all of us in this country. So we had to make these political links. And we have the opportunities now with this campaign to, in fact, do that. And uh, as I go to my, my, my chair, because my time is, is, is out just about, um, let's remind ourselves of this marvelous opportunity. Let's remind ourselves of the fact that we are, in fact, on the right side of history that there are numbers of people in this country who are prepared to join us, who are, are quite frankly, uh, tired of, of endless war. All they are looking for now is an opportunity to be more involved. They're looking for voices that, that amplify their concerns. So let's be those voices. Let's build this campaign, and let's build an effective anti-war movement here in this country. Thank you.